limitations of um, the IOCTL interfaces and the fact that we were using fixed format C structures to pass arguments into the kernel calls. And Netlink, um, I think it might have been um, inspired by IPv6 extension headers or I don't know, maybe XML a little bit because it was created in a similar time frame. Uh, it basically allows to be more flexible about which um, fields are basically present in the system call. So you can, it it's, looks like an IPv6 extension headers for those who, who are familiar with that, and, but it's also possibly slightly similar to an XML where, um, where basically the structure the structure of, of is defined, but the contents are up to the user. Um, unlike an XML document though, uh, Netlink is a binary format, so it's not self-describing. Every member of the, every attribute in Netlink is turned into a, into a C structure effectively. Um, so the information about like the meaning of the fields is kind of lost when it's translated into the binary format. Um, every attribute is a TLV. Um, structure, so it has a type, it has a length, and then it has data. Um, the type is uh, defined inside an enum, so the binary message that goes into the kernel just has an integer ID, and you have to know basically which enum the ID is taken from to interpret what is there. Um, the length is pretty obvious, and the data is, again, um, requires some prior knowledge because there's no information inside the netting message that would tell you how to interpret the data. You have to know whether it's a string or a integer or what, whatever else. Um, and one thing that I haven't mentioned yet is that the, one of the strengths of Netlink is that you can nest attributes. So you can have a structure review the structure and it can be variable size. There's no problem. Basically you can, you can do nesting um, and create sub attributes. And the last bit of information that's like left on the left, uh, listed on the left side is the command itself, which goes into a fixed format netlink header, and there's other fields there. But um, that's basically the message structure. I hope it provides sufficient clarity for the purpose of this talk. Um, the, there's three basic uh, message exchanges between the user and the kernel in netlink. The most simple one is the user space sends a request to the kernel responds with either an arc or an error. The second communication pattern is a notification. So we can have a user which registers for notifications, user one in this example, and when another user makes a change or a event happens asynchronously in the physical world, like someone unplugs the cable, the user which registers for the notifications will get notifications about something changing in the state of the system which allows basically an efficient way of w waiting for events and monitoring for things happening in the system and maintaining a copy inside the user space of the state that's in the kernel without like falling for changes. And the last um, message exchange pattern is a dump, which allows the user space to basically get information about all the objects that the kernel knows about. Um, so the user makes a request to get some object information, sets the dump flag in the, in the request, and then right here. And then the kernel, instead of sending a single response, will send the multiple responses, basically listing all, that, all the objects that it knows about. And at the end, it sends a dump message to delineate that there's a, that's the end of the dump. So um, that's pretty much it. Uh, I wish that was all there was to say about Netlink. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, Everybody has their own ways of tweaking things. Um, a few things that I'll mention just briefly that make Netlink relevant still and interesting, I think, is um, I think it solves all of the problems that people complain about, about UAPIs in general. Uh, so it gives people the ability to do introspection. There's no need to probe for features. Netlink can basically tell you which commands the kernel supports which attributes it understands, like which ranges the attributes can take and a lot of things. Um, so there's no need for probing basically. Um, it can support error reporting, uh, both in a machine readable form where it like, basically points at an attribute and said, this attribute was wrong or this attribute was missing. Or it can just send a, like a message string that says what was wrong in English. Um, another 
thing that most people are not aware of, and I wasn't aware of, to be honest, until I started um, this uh, project. Uh, it, mapping can maintain local objects, that objects that are local to the socket. So you can create some objects in the kernel using your Netlink socket that you opened. And when you close the Netlink socket, those objects will be torn down automatically. So um, the wireless folks make use of that. I, I wasn't aware that that's the case, but it's actually there. Um, and the other, uh, the last one is that we usually do communication between user space and the kernel, but it's also possible for the kernel to call the user space if things are set up properly. So yeah, there's a lot of flexibility and uh, a lot of advanced capabilities are there. So now to the main point of the talk, um, why are we talking about YAML and what I'm trying to fix by use of YAML? And I mean, I don't have it in the slides, but um, the short version of it is um, I'm not capable of writing user space code. Um, at least I'm not capable in covering all the languages that people want to use. So I'm trying to find a way of basically making it possible for people to use Netlink with whatever language they feel like on the day without me having to write a library for them that will parcel the attributes and do all the manual work in Netlink. Um, um, so right now when you write user space, we usually write the kernel side and then we write some user space tooling like a CLI, usually IPRO2. And that's the extent of like what the kernel developers do. But obviously users may want to call the kernel directly instead of shelling out to a CLI. And our story about how to discover the netting protocols is pretty bad. Um, it usually ends up being like reading the kernel code and figuring out what the kernel understands instead of having a documentation. Like I think eTool is the only netting family that uh, I'm familiar with that has a proper documentation that lists all the attributes and all the things that are possible to do. And everything else you have to read the code. So, um, the YAML specification is supposed to fill in the gaps uh, and describe the, the protocol between the user space and the kernel to make it possible to basically make Netlink serial serializable and deserializable for any language, um, any modern programming language. So if you ever worked with like JSON or a YAML file in something like Python or Go, you just load the file and then you, the file that you loaded gets translated into um, like the typical structures and typical types for the language. And for Netlink, we have to do all, the, all, all of that manually. So the point is, if we have an external description that specifies what the kernel is sending, um, we can basically do this serialization and deserialization automatically. Um, so this example is for the, for the um, getlink and setlink uh, command that I was showing in the previous slides. We specify the operations and the attribute sets. This is obviously a single specification. I broke it up for the slide. Um, we specify the name of the commands and then basically what attributes they take. And then we define all the attributes that the messages can contain. And the important bits of information here is the name because Netlink binary representation does not have any information about the names. And if we want to translate the message into something that the user, the, the programmer can interact with, like a dictionary in Python, we need to be able to name the field. Um, then we have the type, so we know how to deserialize the value. And uh, if for nested values, we also have basically a link to, to the attribute space, which will be nested within that value. So basically we can do chaining of of the attribute um, lists. So if we have a YAML description like that and a generic Netlink library that just understands YAML descriptions, does not understand any specifics of the family, we can write Python code like I have here on the left, right? So it's a, almost a, an a exact example from what I had in the RFC patches that I posted. We have a YAML, implement, YAML Netlink implementation here, the YNL library, which is generic and doesn't know anything about any of the families. We just give it the YAML description of a family, and then we can make a call um, and specify the attributes like you would normally for an RPC call in, uh, in Python. So just a dictionary of fields, with fields. Um, extra details um, on the YAML specification. So obviously for setting, we only have the request. The reply is uh, um, 
pass fail basically. Um, for Gatling and other commands, there might be attributes going in both directions. So we have um, a section for the do command, and then there's attributes for the request and the attributes for the reply. And similarly, there's a dump because the commands usually can do both. At the get commands can usually serve both as a get and as a get dump. There's two sections for the for a get command. There's a do section where, which is used when the dump flag is not set, and there's a dump section. Um, dumps often do not take any attributes on the input, so this often on the output. Um, another thing that we have to provide in the spec is the IDs. Um, so we want to be able to use this um, from languages that do not that, that are not able to include C um, UAPI headers. So we need to be able to enumerate exactly, for instance, that the net dev attribute has the value of one. So the way I implemented it, um, the enumeration of between the attributes listed in the specification and the integer IDs is the same as for um, for a C enumeration, right? So the first one will be zero, the second one will be one, and so forth. But if we have to override it, we can specify the optional value value um, property, and it will give that value to the current um, attribute, and then the next one will be plus one, and so forth, like it would be in an, in a C enum. We can do that for attributes and for operations. So yeah, that, uh, that that's the value basically that goes into the type element. Um, and uh, one more thing is um, when we specify the interface between the kernel and the user space, there's often enums or flag fields and uh, information that we really want to be able to translate into a string representation um, as well as the attribute names themselves. So there's a section for definitions in the spec. This is an example taken from the DPLL work um, where you have a status of a DPLL and um, the value inside the netnic message will be an integer representation of this enum, but in the code, we probably want to use like the string names. So the YAML spec also contains definitions of enumerations and flags. So flags uh, name bits, so one, two, four, eight, 16, etc., and enums are enumerated zero, one, two, three. And that's the difference between the two. And then we can link that in the attributes and the YAML specification, basically, that's how the YAML specification expresses that a given field can use those string representations. And um, last thing is um, because we want to generate kernel code, so we don't have to write both the YAML specification and the policy inside the kernel. There's extra fields that are like basically kernel use only. Um, flags for the operations, example, admin only, which means you need to be basically um, administrator to, to run the command. And uh, checks, which is what we use in the policies um, for range checking of the attributes. I have an example of min max, but we also have uh, mask checks, et cetera, et cetera, for, um, for the policies in the kernel. So um, with that YAML specification, we can generate the UAPI header automatically so that the user doesn't have to write it, write all the information in two places. We can generate the operation table automatically for the kernel and the policy tables and hopefully documentation and then require people to actually write documentation. And um, on the user space side, obviously it gives us the ability to to automatically serialize and deserialize. And uh, whatever that means for a language, um, for a modern language, it will probably mean some dynamic typing, hopefully, and dictionaries and stuff. For a less modern language, like C, you can just generate a parser and like format the messages into C structs. Um, one more word on the error handling. So I said that uh, netting can report errors in both a string format and uh, basically pointing at an attribute and saying that the attribute was wrong. Um, it's all great in theory, but currently we actually don't make much use of the point and an attribute and say that it was wrong because the user space does not have a full attribute table and it does not know how to translate the message that it sent itself back into the attribute ID. Like when you type a command in IP route, it will go through all the attribute, uh, all the arguments and basically put attributes into the buffer, but it is not able to go back and like link up what the 
exact attribute was and what it meant. But if we have the YAML specification, we can map the IDs back to names, meaning we can figure out, basically when the kernel tells us this arg argument was wrong, we can figure out what, um, what this attribute was. Basically, based on the ID, we can get the string name and go inside, figure out based on the ID of this attribute what it was and bring it printed to the user. Um, um, as I already mentioned, um, I think it's slightly more complicated than I wish it was. So I have um, levels of IPI specified. So for the new families, I hope we can basically stick to what I presented in this presentation. And that will be it. That's basically the entire spec. But um, people have found various, um, you know, um, inventive ways to make use of NetLink. And for, to be able to describe the, those families with YAML, we'll have to get another um, type of YAML specification that will be a superset of the, what we have here with some extra attributes that will basically account for the weirdness. And for NetLink, um, the classical NetLink that is used to co configure the IP and routing stack, we need another, yet another layer of uh, complications because um, it's not generic NetLink based. Um, in terms of progress, I have the code. Um, I posted, the, I think, two RFCs. It uh, covers the new families, obviously, because I can nudge them into fitting into this paradigm. Um, it covers foo pretty well. Um, it can be used with eTool and DevLink, although they do fall into the legacy category, unfortunately, but uh, they don't need too many quirks. And, um, and I have talked to, I think, the PyRoute maintainer, and he seems to be on board. So hopefully the Python support will land soon as well. Uh, that's it. That's all my slides. So you mentioned quirks. Can you briefly give an overview of how uh, bad the, those quirks would need to be? Um, so there's, uh, I have a list of them in the documentation. Um, the three that immediately come to mind is um, the older families make use of fixed format structures. So you would not have an attribute for an integer and an attribute for a string, you would have an attribute for a structure. So you need to also support like basically formatting structures. So you can put in the YAML spec basically, you know, a description of a C structure, and then that will be the value in the attribute instead of it being a single member. Um, there's also like magic use of the flags in Netlink. There's uh, flags defined for like create, append, and stuff. And there's like a couple of families that make use of those flags, even though they're like, they seem like an idea that someone once had, but they don't really make much sense. Um, and then a lot of families also use different enumeration for things going to the kernel and from the kernel for some reason. So, yeah. Um, so a, a comment, not a question. Uh, I mean, I really like this uh, idea. Uh, I work on system D and we have this SD Netlink library uh, for formatting of messages. Uh, and it has been uh, like an internal thing, but we are just working on making it public. Uh, and I think this could be useful uh, as a basis for user space. Uh, and uh, I would love to, uh, well, generate our code that writes the netlink messages this way. What language do you have it in C? In C. Right. Uh, this is awesome. I think we talked offline. Um, the biggest problem with all this is is the name, right? Netlink. Well, you have suggested netlink. So what if we go one step further, right? We do kernel link. We, we keep sockets in that link, but we do new, let's say, syscall where the data is passed like through the memory. We keep the TLV, all the schema stuff, but it will be just like a syscall, like we have in BPF, right? But this format will be flexible, extensible, and maybe will not depend on networking, and maybe core systems will use it instead of IOCTL. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, maybe. So you mean like don't use a socket at all? Yeah. Why do you need a socket? It's just like you need just a chunk of memory where you can. Marshall on Marshall, the stuff, right? Yeah. Technically. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I don't have the need for that, to be honest. I mean, it's, it would be good for people adopting it outside of networking, but uh, for the use cases that I have when I want to convince people to use NetLink, You need the file descriptor for the purposes of context. So, for example, when you're doing a dump, you have to remember where you left off before you finish. You're going to just dump everything into, into a huge chunk of memory. You don't have infinite memory to dump yeah. everything. You have to do it piece. Yeah, you need a file descriptor. You it, need something, yeah. some, something. Okay, but maybe that, again, maybe that's something that's networking specific and we need huge dumps. Maybe some people just need like small pieces of data uh, back and forth. I mean, if you have file descriptor, you can still do multiple oh, reads, yeah. right? Um, I had a question, which is you mentioned generating kernel code from the description. How much would be generated slash how would that work? So um, I was hoping that it would generate the parsers and a lot of the manual looking at attributes inside the kernel as well automatically. But um, people have found very like, you know, amazing ways of, of writing that code. So at the existing, when I looked at the existing families, there is no single family where I can sing, simply like Take a part, take a manual parser out and put an automatic parser in. Everything is really like all over the place. So I can only generate the, the tables that the kernel already has. So the policy table, the operation table, and the UAPI header. But like the parsers are really hard to replace. So a, a bit smaller scope of what was suggested over there, would it make sense to re-implement um, all the query bits in terms of GE NetLink with a view to retiring the old NetLink in a decade or two? It's like if you're automatically generating it, just having an automatically generated translation bit would be fairly straightforward, I guess. Yeah, we could do a translator basically that would take G NetLink and turn it into a Netlink route, Dave has a comment. So we could say that any new net Netlink family or GE Netlink family should uh, use the YAML format to generate. Right, I think Talk wants to get, uh, like being able to set an XTP on a link, you still need to go to the very old Netlink families, even though it's a new feature. So it would be good if we can do like modern yeah. things over modern interfaces, right? Yeah, and, and also just like, so that you get the, automatic compatibility with GNetLink so that eventually we can have one nicely designed format instead of all the old query bits. And if we have automatic generation, we could, if the kernel could maintain a compatibility layer so that new users-based tools only need to know how to speak GNetLink and not the old NetLink. Yeah, that's a good idea. An intern project for next year? Okay. Very quick question, which is, uh, what is the plan for making sure that, it, that this description and the actual implementations stay up to date together, basically? Like, is there a, do you have a plan for like, I don't know, uh, whatever, like a CI check to make sure that it actually, the description, that like, if you add a new feature, the description is not missing. So if we that generate the policy table, you will not be able to use any attribute that you edit inside the kernel unless you update the YAML, because there will not be, it will be rejected by the kernel. On the output, yeah, and we will need to catch it in review. You could even use the YAML to automatically generate test cases. Yeah. Oh, someone, I think I, Ido mentioned that we should talk to the Sysbot people so that they can learn how to fast netting better over using this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Missed it. Um, so as a potential Netlink library author, um, how does this, how does this help me? Like what's the, what does the flow look like? Um, Cause I guess I still need to know uh, like the binary format uh, to send over the Netlink socket, right? So what does this YAML spec give me? How, how does it save me time? Yeah, I mean, if you need to write a library from scratch, it just removes the need to update it later on. You still need to know how NetLink works and all the details, basically. But the hope is that you just do that once, and if your colleague later on needs to 
add an attribute, they don't have to worry about all the netting bits. They just regenerate the code or they just use a new YAML description, right? And there's no work to be done there. Cool, thanks. Uh, the second talk today will be by uh, Daniel, and he'll be talking about coronal data bus. It'll be very exciting. All right, so hello everyone, and welcome to the talk about the uh, Cilium BPF's kernel data path refamped. So uh, what I want to talk about is essentially four parts. One is the motivation on uh, what happened recently as an, as an incident in one of the user environments, which motivates this whole uh, talk. The next step is a little bit around context for uh, the TC object model and what BPF links are. Then the third part will go into the uh, refm design of the TC BPF data path, and the last one is the BPF link integration for it. So, interference at Prio one handle one. <laughs> for this, I want to give an overview uh, how Cilium's BPF data path looks like. So, essentially, we attach BPF into a lot of things. Um, you can see here the host and also a Kubernetes pod. Most of the programs we attach to are inside the host. Uh, the core data path in Cilium is based on TC BPF. That's where all the forwarding happens, where the, you know, policy is implemented, various other things. Uh, we also attach to the XTP layer on the physical devices, and we also use the socket rest layer uh, for the, you know, for the east-west load balancing in the socket layer. But the core of it is in the uh, TC BPF side. In general, Cilium assumes ownership of the, of the data path. So in Kubernetes, you have a so-called CNI plugin, which takes care of networking. And there's usually one main plugin that uh, does all of that. There's, there are also uh, CNI chaining options where you can, you know, where kubelet, which is a component uh, in Kubernetes, calls into multiple plugins and it works generally, but what they usually do, if there's a minor plugin also attached to it, it will set up, you know, networking devices it will move them into the target uh, network namespace for the part, and then it will typically address and uh, it will typically set an IP address or a route. Uh, but that's pretty much it. And then the rest, uh, Cilium is taking care of. It's attaching BPF programs uh, to it. In case of Cilium, so we, um, if you don't uh, have chaining, then Cilium does all of what I mentioned earlier, and it also installs BPF programs uh, as a CLS BPF instance in direct action mode with prio one handle one <laughs> and there are some options for more advanced users if they want to they can uh set a different priority or handle uh, but then you know all bets are off because what whatever the program is doing that is running before Cilium, it could terminate the pipeline and Cilium may, might not see those packets so essentially if you have policy enforced in Cilium, this would be bypassed if something is going wrong uh, with the other uh, cls instance Right, so that should be well understood in general. Um, so one uh, tale from a recent, recently that we run into in a user staging environment, luckily it was only in staging, <laughs> um, was, an, was an outage. Uh, so essentially the user reported that, you know, clusters have been unhealthy, multiple parts, they run into a crash loop, um, and it wasn't clear whether, you know, it was workload or Cilium part, and, you know, um, something suggests that routing is going wrong or, you know, something on the underlying fabric. So we, we, we did some more debugging uh, together with the user and 
he said that you know pretty much he has the same configuration in Cilium and other versions where it's working and the only difference in this environment was that there were nightly reboots but the rest is pretty much the same uh, they deleted all the policy to make sure that there are no policy drops that could cause connectivity failures and you know some nodes in the cluster were good some others were bad so after a lot of debugging um you know it, it, it really turned out there were no failures in the agent log everything looked reasonably normal and from the system which is something where we grab you know all the comments that are useful for debugging in the system and we put them into a zip file all the states looked reasonably normal no packet drops and no issues from the policy angle the routes look good and also nothing suspicious from netfilter so until we notice this right so bpf tool net saved the day <laughs> because we uh were able to introspect what was going on so Cilium is typically creating LXC devices. Those are weave devices uh, that we create for the pods. So there's like a one-to-one -one mapping. So that looks reasonable. We attach to a CLS act. We attach to the ingress and egress. That looks okay. And our programs that we install, they are typically called like for the containers, BPF LXC. And we have two sections uh, called from container and to container uh, where BPF programs handle the input and the, and the output. But then uh, those programs, they looked suspicious because they were not installed by us. We don't have anything that is named like this. And when we were <laughs> like the, the first thing I tried when, when trying to find the potential source for it was searching on GitHub. So who, who names classifier eager security? And it turned out there was a result, uh, which was from the, from the Datadog agent. And actually this was really it. So this was, <laughs> this was the, the bingo moment where we saw that the agent was actually running in this user's environment, right? So what essentially was happening uh, that the third party agent was, you know, removing all the CLS BPF instances that we initially set up earlier. And it's exactly using the same priority one handle one uh, that, that we had. And, you know, the same agent uh, assumed everything is fine, but actually um, uh, it, you know, it was not. And removing the third party daemon set uh, and restarting the Solium one where it then reinstalls the program, everything got back to working state. Right? So that's the, <laughs> that's the initial motivation of the problem we want to solve, which is the ownership problem. Like, and uh, one way to do that would be BPF links. And I go a bit into more details what BPF links are. So BPF links essentially uh, represent an attachment of a BPF program to a BPF hook point, right? So it's an uh, abstraction on, on top of the BPF programs, they contain a, uh, a BPF program, they hold a single reference to make sure the BPF program doesn't go away. And uh, one interesting thing, which is, you know, in contrast to BPF programs, so the hook points, they do not reference uh, the BPF link. So the BPF link is only referenced either from the application or when you pin it to the BPF file system uh, to make sure it, it doesn't go away when the application exits, right? Um, the BPF link also holds metadata, which is specific uh, to the attachment. You can create it, update the program inside of it, detach it, and so on. So there are a typical set of operations that we have in BPF. And, you know, the application deals with the, only has to deal with the BPF link file descriptor after it did the setup. So after it installed the program and it created the link, but then it can close the program file descriptor because the link uh, has all of it. And it was there, it was the original design to explicitly uh, allow to prevent uh, the proc detachment on when, when the process exits, right? Because if you have a, a file descriptor, they typically get cleaned up, get cleaned up as well. But when you pin it, the BPF link, then uh, that would solve it. Uh, for example, think of a tracing app. Uh, if you want to upgrade the app the, while the program keeps running, that's, that's possible this way. Um, it also coexists with non-link uh, attachments for various hooks and one of the key properties that um, are quite useful in this context as well is that, you know, BPF links, they cannot replace uh, other BPF links, uh, they cannot replace non-BPF links and also the other way around, non-BPF links cannot replace BPF links only, you know, if you have if you don't use a BPF link, you can, you can replace that with something else. So that's uh, important to keep in mind for later. There are currently nine uh, BPF link types. 
that exist today. Uh, they're mostly relevant around uh, tracing and some of them in networking, but there's no TC BPF link. So now a little bit of context around the TC object model and how we could relate it to BPF links. So as probably most of you know, so we have a TC ingress and egress hook. Uh, there's like a, you know, like a fake QDisk, which is only uh, a container for various, you know, for a list of classifiers. They can be BPF, they can also be something else. Um, for BPF, we have the CLS BPF, the direct action mode there uh, means basically that we install a BPF program, as you can see in this case, uh, which does a bunch of things and then it returns in uh, like an action code directly. Uh, this is, you know, like the, the typical way you have classifiers is uh, down below. So you have a classifier. If something matches the classifier, you execute an action. And if it doesn't, you go to the next classifier, right? So that's like the old style uh, that we that is there for a very long time. Um, and the action codes is you have TC Act Unspec, which means you go over to the next program because, uh, you know, like you, you continue in your pipeline, but you can also terminate it with various other action codes, either TC Act OK, where you either push the packet up the stack or down to the driver, uh, TC Act Short, where you drop the packet, or redirect, where you redirect it to a different networking device, which is also what we make use in, in Cilium itself. And there are a bunch of other action codes, but they're not really relevant for, for BPF. Um, this is how it typically looks in, inside Solium. So we just have really, really simple. So we have uh, the TC ingress egress hook. We have the CLS act QDisk. We have one single instance of the BPF classifier with the program in it. And it returns uh, something where we then also terminate the pipeline. And this is also needed because we, as I mentioned earlier, we implement complex things inside BPF programs, such as, you know, firewalling, uh, load balancing, local forwarding and so on. So, you know, the question is, how can we marry both together? And it's a bit, you know, it's a bit tricky because TC has its own object model, which I just described, and it doesn't really fit well together with, uh, with, the, BPF, with the BPF link, right? So if you think of tracing, you know, the, the idea was to um, actually twofold. First of all, to safely clean up everything when you destroy the link and to, to leave nothing uh, behind. And the other thing is to also keep it alive uh, when, you, when you have it pinned. Uh, the, the keeping alive part exists today with CLS BPF because you can just you know, terminate TC or whatever loads it um, and that still uh, keeps running, but there's no good concept around the ownership. Um, like going back to the you know, original or all the discussions on the mailing list, it's actually interesting. So for you know Facebook folks, uh, the, the whole motivation around uh, TC uh, BPF links is uh, around the safe auto detachment. So they run into an outage where an application crashed and it got rescheduled and then you know it, it, it left the CLS BPF instances behind. And then you know they drain resources from your machine or they were you know dropping packets, so the behavior turned out to be inconsistent uh, because of leftovers. And the other thing is, you know, like for for tracing, for, for K-probes, U-probes, it, it was kind of implicit and like until it has been made explicit with the BPF link support for it. And really the, the contract uh, that the BPF link must provide here is to, uh, to guarantee that the BPF program will be executed. In the case of Cilium, it's, you know, it's, it's exactly the other way around. So, you know, we need some kind of flexibility. So in, in Cilium, it's, you know, what, what we want to do is to be able to upgrade the Cilium agent to a newer version while the BPF program uh, stays alive in the data path and while traffic can keep flowing. So, you know, like, uh, so how, how, how can you marry, you know, those two things together? So basically the BPF link would kind of have to, you know, prevent uh, CLS BPF proc detachment, uh, you know, like similar, with similar semantics from around the tracing. Um, but it's not straightforward transferable because, you know, in the TC side, we are not FD based, right? So, for example, the CLS Act QDisk, they could just wipe the CLS BPF instance and, you know, everything is gone nevertheless. Um, and also the other thing is other classifiers around TC, they don't really fit into the picture because, you know, B, uh, BPF is just one of them. Um, so it doesn't really fit well into TC internals. And just to show you, there was an an attempt uh, earlier to, to try to um, 
make it fit together. And it's it's kind of intrusive and kind of very specific to, to BPF where you have to touch TC core bits, which is a bit ugly. Um, so some additional thoughts here. I mean, like the motivation that I mentioned earlier is the safe ownership model for TC BPF programs in Cilium. So, you know, like cooperation between BPF programs, it can be possible, I mean, through the TC Act unspec, but you really have to make it explicit. So you cannot have imp implicit, uh, like an implicit um, cooperation where, you know, when both programs assume they own the data path, it's just not, you know, possible oftentimes to make them work together. So the BPF link should really act as a, you know, safeguard to potentially um, to protect those different components from stepping over each other. So with that, how does the RefM design look like? So if you take a step back, um, you know, like back in 2015, when we originally merged it, it was like, you know, it, it, at, at that time it kind of fit. Uh, but nowadays, you know, the usage around BPF has skyrocketed. So, uh, you know, I thought, well, can we do actually better uh, today? So some of the lessons, you know, learned from the TC data buff, um, which are, you know, kind of obvious in, retro in retrospect nowadays, um, are that, you know, the relevant parts from the queue disk, they are like an, on the actual queuing, like the FQ or FQ coddle. And for the, you know, like those fake queue disk for the ingress and egress hook, they are mostly used around two things, I would say. Um, one is like, you know, oftentimes a slow path for the hardware of loads, such as the open switch. And then the other thing is also on the BPF side where we really want to have a fast path. Um, from the user experience side, you know, the CLS BPF has been hard to use. Uh, LibBPF helped a lot with that. So, you know, like small extract, how you can program this today. So it really abstracted away a lot, but it's also not perfect because given there's no ownership model, there, like the, the cleanup part is also um, not really fully clean because the CLS Act QDIS, for example, you cannot remove because you, you don't know whether, I mean, it could be racy, right? So, yeah, basically requirements we want to have if you want to redesign it. So it should be FD based so that the BPF links blend in perfectly. Uh, it should be, it should have multi attachment, but it must be efficient. Um, the minimum, there should be minimal overhead uh, going into a BPF program. Uh, it should be easy to, to program and to consume uh, from an API perspective. And ideally, we don't want to, you know, add yet, get more hooks to the networking stack. And it must uh, support a migration path, you know, where people still use old style CLS BPF and, you know, they want to migrate over. Uh, and the TC programs ideally should not, uh, should not be changed. So they should be supported as is. And, you know, this is what I came up with. So you have essentially the TC ingress egress point. Here you have a small array and then you can call like all the side here on the right is still the old style. So there's no change in behavior or semantics. But what you could do is you could, you could add additional en entries and you could attach um, BPF programs into it uh, through this, you know, new style of attachment, which would be FD based, right? And if that BPF program does like a TC Act unspec, it will continue in the pipeline and continue with the, with the old style uh, Q-disks and, and classifiers, right? Just as the, in, in, the, in exactly the same way like the, the old uh, TC framework does. So you can, you know, add multiple of those, but what you also can do is if you, if you don't use any of the, of the old style TC stuff, you can just terminate and that's it. So the, the attachment here is through BPF net, uh, ingress and egress. So I, uh, this is through the BPF system call. That's what I implemented. And uh, net of, uh, like the, the data path side, the, the code in here looks as follows. So you, I'm just taking the ingress as an example. So you have the schedule um, handle ingress. So that's as is. And now the, the new implementation essentially um, you know, runs, runs a bunch of BPF programs and really only handles the essential TC uh, return codes. And the uh, sket run procs just looks like this. It's just a simple array, which is then also, you know, more cache friendly. And if there's TC unspec, we go over to the next one. If, it, if, if there's not, we terminate the pipeline. And the old style uh, TC basically also blends into this uh, by having, you know, by being one of the elements that we have in this array that we can call out to. So like for comparison, 
Um, you know, from the entry point with the old style, we go into TC classify. Inside there, we have a list of the various classifiers, and then we have this indirect call to classify. Then we go into CLS BPF as one example, and there again, we have a list of BPF programs, and only then we go to our actual program and execute it. Worst case, even we have to do an allocation on the, on the return path if there's like a TC Act unspect, um, which is not so great, but that's what is there um, today. And with the new style of attachment, uh, you just go into the run procs, you go over the array, you, you run the, and execute the programs, and, and that's it. So we, doing a micro benchmark, uh, we were basically able to half the cycles needed for you know just going to a BPF program, having a verdict. Um, of course, that's all when you know cache is hot. So I would uh, assume the diff would be bigger when it's not hot in the cache. Um, and yeah, how does it look like from a from a user API? I also did the implementation in libpf. So essentially, you have an if index, uh, and there's a priority. Priority can be zero, which is pretty much similar to you know the old style TC, where it would then auto allocate the priority, or you set it explicitly. Um, and then you have BPF proc attach ops, where you specify the file descriptor, the if index, the location, and then you know your your additional options where you want to replace something or not, and your priority. Same for query, you can query uh, at the ingress or egress location of a given net device in your network namespace, and then you can gather all the information related to it. And the, and the output is essentially that you get back like a program ID, uh, here a link ID, I will go uh, into this a bit later, and then the priority. So you get the list of programs attached to that. And the detachment is also pretty simple. So you just uh, specify the priority, the index, and the location, and then um, it gets uh, removed again. So essentially, like this um, FD-based uh, uh, data path, you know, now that we have it, uh, it we, we can implement BPF links on top of it. Um, it also allows for like you know like an initial migration path for application because. Uh, before they implement all the link management in the later step. And this multi-attach uh, array that I mentioned, it's right now I, I picked a 32 slot each uh, because you know if you have more than that, it will probably slow it really down, but it can be made dynamic. It has the same priority concept as the rest of TC. And the outer allocation and the you know the TC action codes and the semantics are also pretty much uh, the same. And for the for the ingress and CLS act, they basically use the same API internally from within the kernel. So the integration with BPF links as the last topic. Um, so from the kernel side, they are then supported for the new FD based uh, TC BPF data path. Uh, they contain the you know like a TC link object for BPF uh, contains the device priority uh, and location attributes. Um, they implement the attachment, the atomic update, and the detachment, and you know they solve this initial problem of the ownership that I mentioned in the introduction. So um, that's essentially how it looks. And from the from the libbpf, I added two new you know uh, TC sections. One is for the ingress and one for the egress, because then we can also map this to the to the two new uh, enums that we use. And the BPF link implementation for that looks also really straightforward. Uh, so we specify again the if index and the priority. And after we load a skeleton, um, but I mean, that, that's for libbpf, for others, they don't have to. Um, then we have a BPF program attached TC API where we just specify the individual program with the if index and priority. We get the link object back and this can be you know cleaned up naturally. So, yeah, that's it. Um, I have a POC code with everything I talked about in here in the private branch and cleaning it up. And um, yeah, goal is to send it out sometime around next week. So yeah, thanks. Uh, and yeah, any questions? So um, you said you had an array of programs. So you're still doing like the indirect calls into each program? Yeah, I mean, for for BPF, you have this anyway, the the indirect calls, right? I mean, yeah. like from from this array to the program itself. Yeah. But would would it make sense to like for XDP, we have this generated trampoline 
stuff. So you get rid of the indirect call side. You can basically generate the array thing as direct calls that loops through. Mm -hmm. Would be possible, but then the problem is right now, I mean, this needs to be supported on all architectures, right? We, we could do this in the, in the future, but, uh, you know, like, I, I, I didn't see, you know, a straightforward way initially, at least. Oh, okay, so, but it could be a performance optimization. Just it could be, yes. Product. I mean, it, it doesn't prevent it. I mean, the, from the user API perspective, it would be the same, right? And, and I, as far as the, the API is concerned, I think it makes a lot of sense. Can we have the same thing for HTTP, please? Again? Like can, can we do the same thing for HTTP with oh. the uh, multiple priorities? <laughs> <laughs> Probably, yes. <laughs> that was exactly my question. Like, it feels that, like, if we adopt this concept for PC, like, we can do the same for XDP and just say, well, <clears throat> I, I would be, as, as someone who has implemented this in user space with a libxdp, I would be in favor of moving it into the kernel. It's mm. basically the same uh, yeah. concept that we're doing. So that would make a lot of sense. Yeah. It, it could be used for sure, yeah. I mean, the one thing we probably have to get rid of is like this, uh, this, this branch funnel that we have, like the, the branch generator from Bjorn. That's the trade-off. Um, but, but not necessarily. That could be replaced with the generated trampoline. Yeah, yeah, probably. And we could share that code between TC and HTTP. Yeah. So uh, I have some, a different question. So why are you still calling it, like in the code, you're still calling it a scheduler? There is nothing scheduler? In that, like SCH, I'm assuming is scheduler, right? Yeah, yeah. And why you still call it TC? Like, why is it all TC? It's nothing to do with TC, right? It's. I think like the. I mean, most people have it these days as a mental model, right? I mean, yes, it has nothing to do with TC, but it's like the the whole layer that we talk about. So we have XDP layer, TC layer, and socket layer, whatever you know. So I think yeah, you know. But like, can we call it SKB? Layer, so we have like XDP, which is like packet based RAM, and here like SKB. So that's the first thing like SKB does, and well, maybe call it SKB layer because that's kind of what it is. It's not this. Well, TC, TC has so much like <laughs> legacy, including like all, all of the opcodes. Like, can call it TC, I don't mind. It's just like it feels like if you're doing like a clean slate like design. And like we can preserve all of the like action codes to be like compatible, but instead of calling it TC act unspec, call it whatever. SKB drop or like mm -hmm. SKB yeah. redirect, SKB pass. Well, because that's what it's doing. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, like just the, an idea. The, the, like yeah, yeah. TC also kind of makes sense, like not <clears> to confuse people because it's exactly the same, but still just schedule or NTC. That, that could be some more unification between TCP, and, uh, sorry, HTTP and TC here as well, right? Have net ingress HTTP, net ingress FKB, TC, something. So, but that, the attachment could be pretty much the same. Yeah, I'm fine with that. I mean, the one thing maybe like, how do you then call the, <laughs> I don't want to, uh, you know, like how, how do you call the C group ingress, egress thing where we are, uh, have an SKB hook, right? Yeah, so, C group. But... C group is KB, but they like they will have a C group <laughs> prefix, so it's not okay. the biggest. But yeah. So, oh, by the way, one one small comment, like about this TC act short and all that stuff. We should probably start defining them in as in arm so they get into vmlinux.h and you don't have to like pound define all that stuff. So, but uh, actually, what I wanted to mention that. Uh, would it make sense to support cookies as well there? So like, imagine you have like the same cookies. sort of uh, BPF program that controls multiple interfaces, right? Mm -hmm. uh, by attaching the same program, just specifying that this is interface one, one, two, three, and all the stuff, and then fetching that's true. That makes sense, right? And like you yeah. have a new program. So. That makes sense, yes, I agree. I've seen you do priorities again, isn't it? You mentioned on the first slide that you've got into the 
problems because of that. Should we maybe uh, do something similar to what we have in C groups, where you can, when you attach the program, you say, my program plays nicely with others, so the others can either override me or they, they run all together, right? We have in C group, we have this chaining. Should we also have something here saying like, oh, I want to be exclusive program that owns this interface? or I know I can play nicely with the others. And I mean, if you know you can play nicely, then you don't have to specify a priority, right? You just let it out allocate and you just need to make sure that you have this uh, TC act unspecced or like SKB continue, whatever you call it, right? I mean- But I guess the, the, the problem, I, right? You have you have this one data daemon set that wants to do something and then you have Celium. Yeah. I don't think this solves it, right? They still, it, no, they're still ordering, I think, still- I don't think you can fully solve it because like there are different teams, you know, they implement different programs and maybe some of them expect ownership, others not. You actually have to talk to each other to really make, to make something work because you have all the actions where you want to drop or where you want to redirect. So it's not really possible, I would say. But yeah, and playing nicely with others can also be unilateral, right? You can have a program that can work with Cilium, even though Cilium doesn't think it can work with it. If it's just something that monitors the packets by becoming an That's account. possible, yeah. Yeah. So you like if if you make it up to the program and say, I am exclusive, everyone is going to say they're exclusive. And we really need the operator to be able to override this and say, no, I have this monitoring program that I need to run before that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. By default, but you can say Maybe not with links. It might be by the only if the links are used, though. Yeah. Thank you. We're doing amazing today. Everyone is just perfectly on time, half an hour each. So the next talk, uh, next half an hour before the break, Anton from Isovalent will talk about new uh, map. I think he sent the patches and I don't think you had like plenty of comments on the mailing list. So. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Anton Protapopov from Isovalent. And yeah, let's talk about how to do packet classification using BPF. And in fact, using one single map in BPF. So uh, we will look at uh, different algorithms which can be used for online packet classifications. And then uh, I will review the API of this new map and show some numbers uh, to so that people can see how it works, how it fits inside PPF. So packet classification in general, we have a set of rules, then we have a stream of packets and we need to match uh, common packets with rules. And rule can be as just simple like we filter by source address or source prefix or a port range, or it can be a combined rule where we have several fields inside packet and we want to match all of them, like four or five tuple or something else. And uh, of course, a requirement is that we have fast lookups as fast as possible because we have a stream of packets. And Online packet classification, uh, like in white papers, uh, it's the same, but it also requires fast updates so that updates can be made not by operator typing things, but just by robot. So use cases for packet filtering are pretty like obvious and generic. So software defined networks, uh, any kind of firewalling, uh, routing decisions, etc. In Silum, we have uh, at least three use cases, which fits uh, well with this map. One is the Silum XDP per filter. It's a simple DDoS mitigation mechanism 
right now uh, it supports filtering packets either by source address or by source seeder. And in the first case, a hash is used. In the second case, uh, an LPM tree is used. And um, new map actually tends to work faster than LPM. So we can like, pretty simple optimized Cilium with this new map. Also, we can let users to specify more sophisticated uh, rules if they want, because when they provide configuration, we can just set up a new map with different configuration. They can filter uh, using not only source address, but other fields as well. The second example is a uh, uh, packet recorder for our standalone load balancer. Uh, there was a talk last year uh, by Daniel and Martins uh, about um, the packet recorder. It supports, kind of supports wildcard for tuples, but actually doesn't because uh, we do not support port ranges. And um, sometimes when you update map with a new value, it requires a recompilation of programs. So it is not an online algorithm. It can take seconds uh, to, to set up a new rule or to delete a, a rule from a table. Another example from Cilium world is uh, Kubernetes and Cilium network policies. Uh, Cilium provides container networking interface for Kubernetes and the latest Kubernetes version um, made port ranges uh, the standard feature. This means we need to support it and we currently don't. We kind of can implement this using LPM, but LPM again is a little bit slower than this hash. And also we can't implement real ranges with LPM. We can uh, implement prefixes, but not ranges. So what is like design decisions for this new map? It, it should support easy configuration between different uh, rule structures. Even in Cilium cases, we have three different rule structures. In the first case, we filtered like source prefixes. In the second, the four tuple. And for Kubernetes networking policy, we actually do, we have a security ID plus a port range. So it's two field uh, map. It obviously needs to support fast lookups and uh, fast updates as fast as possible. And one thing is that um, complexity. For Cilium, complexity is a concern because we have different, way, way different configurations uh, running on different servers. They support different kernels and uh, the solution should be as simple as possible. And in case of map, the complexity is as simple as possible because to insert a rule, you just do a BPF map update. And for matching packets, you just do BBF element lookup. So what are algorithms which can be used for packet filtering in general? So the, the simplest one is brute force. You just take a list of rules and then you match them one by one. And this obviously doesn't scale to more than, I don't know, eight, 16 rules. So there are other two family of algorithms which uh, solve this problem uh, to be scale, scale, scalable. One is hash-based, uh, the other is tree-based. Obviously, hash-based provides something like constant time lookups and tree-based logarithm time lookups. And uh, the, the basic idea between all these algorithms uh, is the same. You take a huge set of rules, you split them into several uh, buckets uh, or tables, it's called tables in most times, and then you do brute force on top of tables. So for each table, you do a lookup. If, if it matched, then okay. If not, then you go to next table. So let's took a look at uh, times which this algorithm provides. Uh, I took this picture from the tuple merge uh, white paper. And uh, here we see several algorithms. The tuple space search on the right, uh, it's used in OVS and it's um, hash-based, uh, the original one hash-based algorithm. The partition sort tree-based algorithm, the previous state of art algorithm, the tuple merge is the new state of art al algorithm, which uh, works 
faster in both lookup and update times than partition sort. And on top, you can see the smart split. Uh, so from this table, it's seen that uh, it, its classification time is the fastest, but its update time can take seconds. So it's not uh, actually a solution. So let's look more precisely at how um, hash-based algorithms work. Uh, I didn't implement and didn't try to implement the partition sort, the tree-based one, because uh, lookup time is logarithmic versus constant, and also tuple merge white paper shows that uh, it, it is slow by both lookup and update time. Um, so let's look at hash-based algorithms. The tuple space search is the simplest one. So we have a set of rules. Uh, in this case, we will just filter by source address for simplicity, one field. And um, the tuple space search uh, joins rules and tables by the length of the prefix. So here we have two slash 16 rules, one slash eight rules, two slash 24 rules, and we combine them into three tables, one with slash 16 prefix, another with slash eight, and another with slash 24. So when packet arrives, say 10 to 2, 2 uh, we need to look up every table. Uh, and first we go to the first table. The first table has a prefix 16. This means that to look up this packet, we apply a mask of 16 bits. And we get this value, and we see that it doesn't belong to this table. So we go to the next table. Here we have a prefix slash eight. So we apply a mask of only eight bits. We got this value, it doesn't belong to this table. So we go to the next table. Here we applied mask of 24 bits and voila, we found the packet inside this table. So this is a match. So what is the problem with tuple space search? So it's not a problem with tuple space search, it's for all this algorithm, but in tuple space search, it's pretty obvious. Like, to do a successful lookup, we need to uh, look up about half of tables. Uh, to do unsuccessful lookup, meaning that package packet doesn't match, we need to look up and all the tables. And uh, even in this case, with one prefix for IPv4, we can have something like 33 tables. If we go to two fields, here is an example for source and destination addresses. Uh, we can see that uh, the number of tables uh, grows too fast. So here um, on the horizontal axis, we have number of rules and on the vertical, we have a number of tables and we can see that even for 100 uh, random rules, the number of tables is already like about 50, 60. And this means that even for 100 rules, we will do about like 30 hash lookups per packet. This is too slow. And uh, for IPv6, it gets worse because we have more randomness, we have more and more different prefixes. And here, for example, at uh, about 10,000, so 20, 20,000 rules, we kept at um, 4,000 tables, uh, which, is, which doesn't work in production at all. So the tuple merge algorithm solves this using several optimizations to tuple search space, tuple space eh, search. So um, first idea is that if we have a particular uh, table with particular prefix, we can we can put their rules which has uh, greater prefix. For example, if we have table slash sixteen. We can put slash 16 rules there. We can put slash 17 rules there. We can put slash 24 rules. If another rule uh, appears like slash eight, then we can't put it inside this table. We'll create a new table. And only this uh, optimization dramatically reduces the number of tables. So this is the same um, experiment with the number of tables for tuple space search. And below you see the line almost line for the tuple merge. Uh, for IPv6, it is really undistinguishable from straight line here. The second idea which uh, can reduce the number of tables is that when we got a new rule, uh, which doesn't belong to any table, 
we don't take a prefix as is, we just trim it a little bit. So for longer prefixes, we remove a little bit more rule uh, bits. Uh, for shorter, we remove a little less uh, bits. But in general, if we have like, for example, slash 16, we create table not slash 16, but slash 14. So slash 16 rules would fill there, slash 15 and slash 14 will fit there. If we see a slash 13 rule, then we will create a new table. This also reduces the number of table. Uh, is it, this is the same example. So on top you see the number of tables for untrimmed tuple merge version. And below you can see that uh, if we trim tables, the number of tables uh, reduce it like twice for IPv4 and uh, even more for IPv6 because we had like, more randomness here. So the third idea, uh, which was used in um, Tuple Merge white paper, uh, and it, it is not applicable to the generic uh, implementation, unluckily. So if we have two fields which differ a lot, like example, we have 24 prefix and, tw and eight prefix. So we can just uh, omit the eight prefix because it doesn't provide uh, a lot of randomness in, in any way. So, but it is not applicable in gen generic case because in Tuple uh, Merge uh, white paper, uh, they filtered uh, four tuples and we have source and destination IP addresses. So we can distinguish, like choose between them. But in general case, uh, we don't know in advance what field means at all. So we can't simply like compare them and decide which to omit and which provides more randomness in general case. So other problems with tuple merge? Yes, there are some problems. Namely, we can't guarantee the number of tables in advance. Uh, this means like, for example, that for if, if we want to pre-allocate map, then we need to pre-allocate way more tables than uh, is required actually. And even in this case, we are not 100% guaranteed that we will have enough memory. But um, another thing is that the number of tables depends on uh, the order in which rules appear. So here's a simple example. We first have a slash eight rule, then we create a table of prefix seven, then we see a slash 16 rule and it fits inside this table. But if the slash 16 rule appears first, uh, then we will create a slash 14 table. And then when slash eight rule appears, we have to create a new table because it doesn't fit in the smallest one. So the order of rules in this small example uh, means a lot. Like uh, the second example will be twice slower than the first one. And uh, when we have a lot of rules, it doesn't like scale exponentially, but uh, it is it is random. So we can fix this by um, pre-allocating tables uh, for a particular map. Uh, in this example, we have uh, IPv6 four tuples. And say we know that no rule will appear with prefix shorter than 32. Then we can just create a 32, 32 table and all the rules will fit inside this table. We still will have 64 bits of randomness, which is uh, enough for hashing. And if we want, for example, to ignore source or destination, we can create not one, but three tables. Uh, and most of rules will still be in, in the first one. So for lookups, it won't slow anything down. So a problem with this is that um, yeah, it's custom tone. So if we created a map for a huge system and said, yeah, there will be only 32, 32 rules, but then two months later, we decided that we need to support 30 slash 30 rules, then it doesn't work. We either need to break them or to reboot the thing. It, it, it is, of course, uh, doable, but uh, uh, not, not very convenient. Uh, another thing which is way more inconvenient is that if we provide API to do something, the users will find a way how to use it wrong and we'll have more bug reports and uh, maintenance sub like burden. So which algorithm to use for this map? Uh, 
so first the idea was to do all the things like to support algorithm brute force and support algorithm tuple merge and then provide a flag to 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 do additional configuration for tuple merge to do like, to allocate static tables and this is what i sent in the first rfc but actually this is not like too too good it's better to to provide less less api and uh, probably the the, the next uh, step will be to provide just a generic algorithm without this additional configuration. If there will appear a better algorithm, we will just replace implementation. So the API doesn't change. And another thing uh, which Stanislav mentioned is that um, in future, we, we will be able to implement such classifiers using BPF itself. So it will be possible to just create a map, uh, load the BPF program, and then say that this map will be classified using this particular program, which provides like a lot of flexibility and reduces like maintenance burden from us because all decisions were are made by users. So let's look at an example. Um, again, the, the example is uh, pretty simple. We will filter four tuples, source uh, and IP destination addresses IPv4 by uh, prefix and then we will have source and destination port ranges. So this is how we uh, define a map. It has type BPF type wildcard. And uh, here we choose the a particular algorithm, uh, which can be omitted in, in future patches. So this is pretty simple. Like this is map description, the, the field structure description, which we use here, uh, we will review it shortly. And to use this map, it's also straightforward. Here we create a rule. So it's a source address and its prefix, it's destination address and its prefix, it's port range and destination port range. And then we just do BPF map update. To look up packets, it's even simpler. We need to copy less fields. So we just copy a source address, destination address, we copy both ports, and uh, we just look up element inside map. So let's look at um, how we define a particular rule structure. So for this map, we say we have four fields. Uh, the, the structure will be called capture for wildcard. And we have uh, f like description of fields themselves. The first field is prefix, it's uh, four bytes. Uh, the second is also prefix, it's also four bytes for the destination address. And we have two 16-bit uh, ranges for source and destination ports. Uh, this name uh, is used uh, to, to specify the structure names in map definitions. So the first one is struct key. It is defined by this macro. We don't need to define anything else. And the second one is uh, a new field in the BTF map definition called wildcard descriptor. And uh, it is required to tell kernel how to interpret uh, the key because kernel sees only void pointer and size. The key itself looks like this. So we have a structure, it has type, it is either rule or element. In, in case of rule, we use this part of union. In case of element or packet, it's names are hard. We use the second. Uh, part of structure, and they look like this. So for packet, it's pretty simple. It's source, destination, address, port, and destination port. And for rule, we have more data. How they match, uh, like this. So we have source address in a packet. We go to the rule, we have source address and prefix. We have destination address, we have destination address and prefix. So we can match them. For ranges, we have a name here and minimum and maximum value in uh, the rule. Again, name here, minimum and maximum value here. So as I mentioned, kernel only sees uh, void key and key size. So we need to tell kernel how to process the, the packets. And uh, it is done by passing uh, this structure in BPF attributes. So we have number of rules. And for each individual rule, we have a, uh, another structure which describes the rule. It's also pretty simple. It's just type and size. So uh, prefix, range, 
and size. So in, for our photopool uh, case, we have four rules and we have four field descriptors. The first one is prefix of size four, uh, four bytes. Another is prefix with also four bytes and two ranges of 16 bits. So there is a one problem. We can't specify the structure in BTF definition because BTF uh, can't uh, get the structures. So we need to actually macro defines another structure, which is parsable, uh, which is understandable by BTF. And then libbpf takes the structure and translates it to the structure which kernel will understand. So we take uh, number of rules here, we just convert it to integer. Then we take the first field called source address and we convert it to prefix and size and so on. So again, uh, for for users, like for users of this map, it doesn't matter all, all this machinery because we just define the simple structure. Then we just pass uh, this name in the key and well, wildcard descriptor without like any uh, uh, problem. So, what kernel changes required to do this besides implementing the map? Uh, another piece of data needs to be added to BPF attributes. So, on map create, we copy another piece of data which contains this wildcard descriptor. And of course, libbpf needs to parse uh, the BTF description to the description which is understandable by kernel. And that's it. No, no, no extra changes. So let's look at numbers. Uh, here we, we see four tuple IPv4 uh, case and uh, rules. We have a number of rules like for, from 100 to 100 thousands. So the scale is logarithmic. And the blue one is the generic uh, tuple merge. We see that it jumps up and down because we don't know in advance the number of tables. The, the orange one is uh, a static tuple merge when we allocated four tables. And the green one is the static tuple merge when we allocated just two tables uh, for IPv4. And we see that like if, if you have less tables, we have faster lookups. But even in generic case, uh, Again, this is uh, the, the right side is for like 100,000 rules. So we still are un, under like, or at like 120 nanoseconds, which is pretty good. For unsuccessful lookups, uh, the numbers are more or less the same, but we see that like for unsuccessful lookup, we'll look up twice more tables. So numbers are twice bigger, but and we see that penalty for having more tables is greater for unsuccessful lookups. This is the same numbers uh, for IPv6 case. The only thing which differs here is that the static table uh, below has only one table. So we actually do only one hash lookup for IPv6. And also one thing to mention, unlikely I don't have uh, numbers here on this plot, but uh, like the generic uh, hash, if you just hash two IPv6 addresses, it, uh, it looks like to be a little bit slower than uh, this static tuple merge, because in, in tuple merge we only use 64 bits versus 256. This is unsuccessful lookups for IPv6. And another uh, slide with numbers is that uh, for simple case, when we just filter one prefix, uh, this map, even if it's generic form without like static allocation, it works faster than uh, LPM tree. Uh, and if we like grow number of rules, uh, it seems that it also like tends to grow less because LPM is logarithmic, we are constant. So for Cilium cases, for example, we can just replace uh, LPM with this new map and we'll just benefit from speed here. This is uh, updates for the LPM and tuple merge. Again, we can see that th there is a difference. So this is almost it, uh, almost fit in time. So this is the, the picture. Uh, from this tuple merge uh, white paper, and you see this trade-off line and unfeasible region. So 
now it looks like this. Uh, the kernel implementation of tuple merge uh, is <laughs> in the unfeasible region. Of course, this means that we need to draw trade-off line in a different place, but still. Uh, and also, I, I want to mention, like, here is, like, half of mi mi microsecond for an update. Uh, even for um, not pre-allocated maps, we have a better number, so I just didn't want to move it here. So for pre-allocated maps, we will have numbers like uh, 100 nanoseconds for updates and 100 nanoseconds for lookups, uh, which, which is actually pretty good. And for, again, this is for big number of rules. If we have thousands of rules, not hundred thousands, it's even faster. So that's it. Please uh, send your use cases for packet filtering so we can uh, refine the user API and do the, like the, the minimum user API visible. And thanks for listening. Many thanks for sharing. Uh, I have two questions about this uh, solution. The first one uh, question will be, is there any uh, rules uh, numbers up limit by this solution? The, the limit on number of rules? Yes, yes. Uh, no, like uh, you can define any number of rules, of course. Um, like it's, it will slow down the lookups because you will have to uh, process more like loop iterations. We have a generic match function. And another thing is that uh, in, in this case, for example, for four tuples, uh, we can just ignore port ranges. So the number of tables depends on like source and destination IP addresses, but the fields uh, with port ranges do not like add any new tables. If you have 10 fields, each of them, each of fields is uh, like important and you can't ignore this, then uh, the possible number of tables can grow like exponentially by number of fields. So you, you need to refine which, which fields can be ignored in this case. So for, for port ranges, it's a general thing that uh, in such algorithms, port ranges are ignored. And so if we has have uh, like hash collision, which brings us to like several port ranges. We just solve it as, as a usual hash map. Thank you. Uh, the second question actually is for production environment. Uh, you know, in, it's not just about the latency uh, for the, you know, rules, uh, also about the memory usage, right? So if, if you have any data for the, you know, uh, memory use, usage for this solution, for example, how, much, how, how many memory you will, uh, will cost yeah, so uh, this costs exactly like a normal hash. So you just have a hash table. Uh, we use only one hash table per all tables. And uh, we allocate buckets, of course, for a hash table. But otherwise, it's, it is the same. Uh, for one example, for in, in your uh, experiment, I saw the four, uh, 400,000 rules. So given the RPM solution, so how many memory will cost roughly? Um, I, I didn't mem remember, I didn't measure the, the memory like precisely, but uh, for hash table, uh, like if you have a hundred thousand rules, right, you will create a hash table with a hundred thousand uh, buckets as, as we do like for a hash. We can, uh, like right now it is done like this and it is done like the hash map, uh, like normal hash map. Uh, in my like early experiments, I did uh, allocate less buckets than the number of rules. And of course, in this case, we have more collisions. But um, again, like we can allocate like four, eight times less back buckets than rules. But uh, this will, of course, impact the, the collisions, the lookup time. Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Lawrence. Can you go back to the slide where you talk about changes to BPF uh, map create? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, that's yep. one more. Yeah, that's one. Yeah. 
So you the extra data is like a, a sized buffer. Can you tell me what's in there? Is that like BTF wire format? Yeah, of course. So the, this uh, buffer contains this the second structure, uh, struct well carved desk, and it, it just contains uh, here second. Yeah, here it is. So in this case, we will pass this structure. So four rules, and then we have the, an array of rules here, an array of descriptors. So we have a generic match function. It, it goes to the first rule. It takes a look here and says, aha, uh -huh, prefix, it's size four and etc. So this one. Yeah, so my, my kind of follow-up question is for other uh, parts of the API where we specify types of IBTF, we usually take a file descriptor for a BTF object and like an ID in that uh, file descriptor. So here you've kind of gone with take a raw BTF uh, buffer, I guess. Um, like, is there a specific reason you did it that way versus the file descriptor? Yeah, I mean, uh, for um, it, it is possible to create a map without using BTF, right? So just use a BPF call. So in this case, uh, like this is like less meaningful, but of course, yeah, we can just say where we are. Uh, we, we can just pass, uh, create, create BTF ourselves and pass the BTF object here. Okay. Uh, slides. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah. So instead of doing this, we can pass a BTF ID. Cool. Thanks. Hey, Anton. Uh, not surprising to see you working on this. I know you've thought about it for a long time. Did you consider leveraging any of the, the routing layer implementation since it's already doing an LPM type match? So it already has like optimized trees for insert, delete, lookups, that kind of stuff and trying to reuse that for this? Um, no. So I didn't have like, <laughs> sorry, I didn't have much time to, to work on this actually. So uh, I just wanted to implement like topper merge in, in form of BPF map uh, and only considered our Cilium use cases yet. So. Because it has well-known, you know, understood properties in terms of it's been highly optimized in terms of lookups and the insert. It knows we know the memory aspects of it. So, anyway, something to consider if it can be extended for this. Absolutely. Thanks. Yeah, I think to. Uh... Oh, sorry. Um... Yeah, so my, my initial comment was I would just like to appreciate the fact that we just heard from Daniel how BPF is now no longer semantically a classifier. And now we have a talk about adding a classifier that can be used from BPF. Um, and I'm sure we'll come full circle a couple of times. So um, in terms of the UAPI, when I saw the patch series, I was, um, uh, it, it was a little bit inscrutable. This helped a lot to explain. I think it would be useful to uh, separate out the BTF format for um, for defining this and the actual UAPI to the kernel, as uh, Lawrence was also saying. Um, also, because we have uh, user space libraries that are not C and BTF based, so having this um, defining and it, like documenting the struct format for actually passing the definition to the kernel separately would be useful for understanding how this works. Uh, and also I fear a little bit that this is like something that will lead to another uh, e-inval hell when you're trying to debug why your definition is not working. Um, and I'm yeah, not sure this, is, this is why I define it this uh, like macro <laughs> to provide such a descriptions. And uh, so I don't know, if, if you look at the slides, like the user API is pretty simple, right? It's five lines, extra lines, uh, comparing to a normal map definition. So users shouldn't think about this at, like at all. Well, as, as long as they just need, want to do a normal fortable uh, match, yes, that's simple for a certain definition of simple. Um, but <laughs> once you want to do weird things with this and, and try to change it, 
the kernel is just I, either it's just going to accept it and your matches will be wrong, uh, or it's going to give you back an e val if the format doesn't match. And and this will, like, this is the kind of thing that confuses users. Right? If you so yeah, for, for for this actually while developing this map, I also was thinking about e val because I had like of course during development some bugs and uh, uh, I had a lot of e vals so i was actually like thinking about doing something like verifier does uh like if if my map update failed i would just pass another map update with a log buffer to do this it will be slow but i just if i need to know the reason then i can just use like a, a second like maybe statically linked version of bpf map update which does the same but provides some insights of what's went wrong <laughs> yeah so like we just heard about netlink and it xed act and it's pointers to which bits are wrong and something. i feel like we're in the way of, re of reinventing that but it's this is a general problem for the bps swift call right you just get back ian val and you have to guess mm -hmm. what's wrong so yeah but uh, for, for this for, for, for this part, particular case i really like think that uh, like this way of just passing a macro which will be just copied by other users is really simpler than creating your own btfs uh, for library it's probably the same right for particular users which just create write like xdp otc programs it will be simpler to just copy five lines probably yeah but so what are, what are the go users and, and rust users going to do Okay. <laughs> uh, going back to what David said, I think it would be interesting to compare this to the, I think you can implement this all with LPM right now. Even the port ranges, I think you can, if you do the like beat mask math, I think you can. So it will be more convincing if the next submission will have comparing this against LPM, array of LPMs, array of LPMs, array of LPMs. Um, yeah, for, for, for one thing with LPM is that you can only do this with one field, right? Yeah, you will have to have essentially like multiple array of LPMs going, I guess, like that. Maybe we can talk, I guess. On, on... Yeah, I mean, uh, if, if you have like, I don't know, N fields, right? And each of them is implemented using LPM, you will have N times logarithm lookup time, right? While here we just, uh, like in, in many cases, we can just uh, jump to like one, two hash lookups. It's it's way faster, even for like yeah. one prefix. It should be pretty easy to show that it's way faster, I, I think. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. The, the, the next thing for me is to like automate making this plots. It's like semi-automated right now. I will uh, publish the test suite and self-test and stuff like this. Great. Actually, historically speaking, this looks like the original FIB hash route lookup algorithm that we used to have. <laughs> like, 